the original ZX Spectrum, a design classic, but maybe it can be improved, though that might be a matter of opinion when you see the end result. Yes, there's a lot that I can do with this here Spectrum to make it better, badder, more brilliant, and ready to battle on in the 21st century. So let's get it plugged in, fire it up, and see how it's working. And yet it does seem to be okay. Yes, we have a fairly crappy picture, but that is to be expected from the RF output. And the keyboard isn't quite functioning as it should be, but this is really very much par for the course with these Spectrums. But the big question is, can I get anything to load? And the answer is, well, not at the moment, it doesn't seem, but I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe there's something wrong with it, or maybe, maybe I'm just a moron, and well, yeah, see if you can pick up on that foreshadowing there. Anyway, here it is, naked and unadorned, ready for me to start poking at it with a soldering iron. So where do I start? What am I going to do first? Well, from what I can gather, it seems like that my loading problem may well be something to do with this diode down here. Yes, this here is D13, part of the tape input circuit, and apparently quite a common cause for the spectrum to go a bit deaf. I'm also going to be dealing with this voltage regulator here. Yes, like so many similar devices, the Speccy has a 7805 voltage regulator and a huge heatsink to go with it. This is not for the CPU or any of the main integrated circuits, it's just for the voltage regulator. And it seems the wise thing to do these days is replace it with a more modern and much cooler solution. I'm also going to be sorting out the picture a bit by bypassing the RF modulator with a composite mod. Handily, the Phono style RF output socket can be easily repurposed for a composite video output. You don't need to worry about a sound output, it's all through the internal speaker on these 48k speckies. Well, let's get to it then. The first thing I think I need to do is remove this huge heatsink, which turns out to be a bit more difficult than it looks, but with a bit of encouragement, off it comes. Now it's time to start thinking about these diodes. These things are so darn cheap and so easy to replace, I might as well do it, even if that's not actually what the problem is. So let's start first by desoldering the old diode, adding a bit of solder just to ease things along and yeah i'm using a solder sucker for this is this the best way of doing things i've no idea but it does seem to more or less work you know what's not fun doing electronics work on camera you know what's even less fun when you come to edit it and you realize it's all blurry and out of focus and you didn't film the critical bit but anyway i removed the old one and soldered in the new one now on to dealing with the voltage regulator so I've got this drop-in replacement that I picked up from the Retroleum store, an excellent place for all kinds of specialised retro products. This is, I believe, an off-the-shelf 7805 replacement that's been adapted to fit perfectly into the specy case. A high-efficiency switched mode regulator that works an awful lot better than the original one. This runs much cooler and more efficiently, so I can permanently ditch that heatsink. It's also probably going to be much more reliable in the long term. And it really is dead simple to just drop it in. It fits in exactly the same way as the old one did. Then it's just a case of soldering the new component in, making sure all the while that you are just slightly out of focus. Okay, at this point, I am going to test if this voltage regulator actually works, just to make things a bit easier on myself. And yeah, it does seem to be doing exactly what it's supposed to, that bodes well. But now I do notice that the power socket itself doesn't seem to be quite right. You need to get it in just the right position for it to work. It's either a dry joint on the connection or maybe it's got corroded inside. Time to desolder it and take a look at it. Definitely the thing to do here is poke at it ineffectually with a screwdriver, then off camera clean it out with some contact cleaner. I do think the problem though was a dry joint, so resoldering it back onto the board should sort that out. Okay, now time to start looking at this RF modulator, time to prise off the top and start thinking about that composite mod. And yeah, this took a little bit more effort than I was expecting, but there we are, let's take a look inside. Okay, first thing to do is desolder the existing connection. 
removing what looks like a resistor but could be a tiny bee on a skewer, you never can tell with Sinclair products, leaving that connector free to be repurposed. Now I found a dead simple composite mod online, it does sound quite promising and uses just a single capacitor. It's quite neat and does seem to be a lot less complex than many of the composite mods you'll find for other systems. Seems to be just a case of getting the video input into the modulator, disconnecting it, desoldering it and then running it through this capacitor straight through to the phono video output. To be honest, it does seem a bit, well, suspiciously simple, but if I can get everything lined up right, it is very neat and doesn't require any major surgery on the spectrum. Okay, that's that done. Does it work? Does it buggery? Yeah, for whatever reason, this just isn't happening for me and no amount of tweaking was able to improve the situation at all. Now, this came from the Retroleum blog, so presumably there's something in it. I'm not saying that it could never work, but it's not working with my TV or maybe it's just my spectrum. So let's move on to plan B. And that is this composite mod which I found on projectavr.com. Maybe a better bet, it's a bit more complex but still not particularly hard to install. In fact it looks like this mod for the Nintendo Famicom which I've done before and it worked very well. Probably a good sign. It's apparently an emitter follower amplifier based on a PNP transistor. Its layout is a bit, well, counterintuitive, but that's definitely how it's supposed to be. Let's see if it works. This is going to require a little bit more skill than the last mod, but, well, not all that much. The hard part is really just getting the layout and squeezing it into the tiny space you've got. Though if you set it all up right, it should fit onto the existing PCB pretty easily. Getting this transistor in and in the right orientation requires a bit of work, but with some bending it goes in just fine. Some revisions of the spectrum have an earth or a ground through hole next to the modulator apparently, but this one doesn't. So I'll just shove this leg of the transistor between the modulator and the ground plane underneath and glom it on with a bit of solder. Then connect the resistor and the capacitor that's already there and finally trim off the excess legs. Now it's time to test it out. Does it work? Well, <laughs> happy days. Yes, indeed it does. In fact, it looks very good. A definite improvement over the RF output. Better in person than it looks here on camera, but the real test will be with some games, but we'll get to that later. For the time being though, this looks like it might well be the right mod. When I put this all back together though, I am a bit worried that the new composite mod circuit might short out against something, so I'm probably going to have to insulate it somehow. It's a bit of a weird shape, but my solution, some heat shrink cut down to fit. So now to heat shrink that heat shrink, what am I going to use? What would be the professional choice? What would Big Clive use? Well, how about this butane torch for some reason? Not a massive success, doesn't work terribly well, and yeah, it did catch fire a little bit. Yeah, briefly on fire and put out fairly quickly by me, thankfully. No serious damage, I don't think, and the only thing that really seemed to come to harm was that strange bit of card that surrounds the video output, and you can't see that when the whole thing's put back together anyway. Yeah, now to take the sensible solution and just shove in a bit of insulation tape, which is what I should have done from the beginning, of course. Okay, then I've done all that I need to do internally. I hope the spectrum is more or less ready to go. Now on to what, for me anyway, is probably the most exciting part. A complete brand new case and keyboard kit. This came from ZX Renew, your one-stop shop for all your ZX Spectrum case needs. I went and bought the full kit, the case, the keyboard membrane, the rubber keyboard mat and the faceplate. It wasn't massively cheap, I have to say, but the quality is absolutely fantastic. It's equally as good as the original, if not better. It certainly doesn't feel like a poor quality replacement. And yet it ended up costing me the best part of 65 quid, but when you consider the quality of it, it doesn't really seem too bad. 
And yes, okay, you might well take issue with my choice of colours. It's not going to be to everybody's taste. But I was thinking, you know what, if I'm going to mod this Spectrum, I might as well go big or go home. And well, if I'm going to be completely honest, if nothing else, it will make an eye-catching thumbnail. Assembling all this is really very easy. All the fixings you need should come in the box. Mine, that wasn't quite true, but I got nearly everything. I had a bit of trouble screwing the motherboard into the case. I ended up using the original screw from my original case rather than the one that came with it. But other than that, it was all quite easy. And these new keyboard membranes are much, much thicker and much easier to get into the connectors than the originals. Then after I've screwed everything together, I'm ready to deal with the new keyboard mat and the faceplate. This is the one area where I did have a bit of a problem. You're supposed to get some double-sided sticky tape with the kit when you buy it that will stick the faceplate down, but I, for some reason, didn't get that. It didn't turn up in the package, so I went out and bought my own. And on reflection, the stuff I got probably wasn't absolutely ideal for the job. I should have got some more permanent tape instead of this removable stuff, but I was a bit nervous about, about sticking it down and getting it wrong, so I went with that. And well, maybe that wasn't the best choice. That's something I will have to attend to in the future. But it does work plenty well enough for me to stick everything together and come up with something like a finished product. And here we are, ready to go at last, ready to test it out. Does it work? Um, well, no, it doesn't seem to. Stuff still isn't loading. What weird, gnarly, complex electronic issue is going on here? Well, nothing at all, as it turns out. It's just that I'm a moron, and this is a case of a problem between the chair and the keyboard. I'd managed to convince myself that my USB audio interface would absolutely, definitely work for this application, but, well, it turns out it doesn't. It's just not loud enough. Yes, the Spectrum needs a fairly powerful audio source to load, and thank you to the people on the Spectrum computing forums for helping me realise this. So my solution is this little audio amplifier, which I had lying around from another project. I managed to wire it up to take a stereo input and give a mono output to stop any sort of lead mismatch, which can be a problem. And yes, this little thing has plenty of power to boost the signal to the level it needs to be. This is from a Maplin kit, and well, Maplin aren't really with us anymore, but you can buy very similar things on eBay for very little. And yes, I've now got the juice to load stuff with my old phone via the Play ZX software, which works really well despite the fact that the battery is completely knackered. So here we are at the end of the process, and I get to try my fully working Spectrum out. What am I going to christen it with? Well, how about Roger the Pangolin? Yeah, okay, that's what got us into this mess, surely. But it's a new and, well, fairly new Spectrum game released in 2020 by who else but Multicolor Master Jason Railton. The graphics are absolutely fantastic, and this is a really cleverly done thing with some fantastic level design. A brilliant compliment to the admittedly fairly garish Spectrum. It just gets better and better the more you look at it, doesn't it? The game, not the computer. Or maybe that too. What else can I have a go on? Well, how about Roller Coaster? A fantastic Jet Set Willy ripoff. Does this get mentioned much these days? Well, probably not, but it'll always be a classic to me. Weirdly, this game was reskinned and it became the Game Boy version of Dragon's Lair six years later. Why? How? I have no idea, but it did. But this isn't the main event, is it? No, no, no. The thumbnail promised something weird with a roll of tape. So let's get to that. How do you play a game with a roll of tape? Well, allow me to demonstrate. Yes, let's pick a track for my racing debut. I think, yeah, I think Monza, <laughs> it will be the ideal venue. Auto or manual, I think it's going to be auto, absolutely. And yeah, let's keep this one dry, I think. And I think we'll go with practice mode as well. And yep, now we're ready for some real racing with a roll of tape as a steering wheel. And yeah, that's the general idea. Steer left and right by rolling this roll of tape back and forth across the top row of keys. 
and of course this is only going to work on the original rubber keyed Spectrum. Later models with, well, decent keyboards, this just, just, just not going to work. This is something I heard about years ago and I've always wanted to try and now finally with a working rubber keyed Spectrum I can. How on earth did this utter weirdness come about? Well, this is Formula One by Spirit Software, the first Spectrum game with a steering wheel controller even if it turned out to be a bit less high-tech than it sounds. The original game was supposed to come with a steering wheel included. I can't find any pictures online. I'm not sure it ever made it into public hands, but a crash review describes it as being like a yellow plastic ashtray. The, <laughs> the white-hot heat of British video gaming technology there, folks. Anyway, the game was re-released by Mastertronic a bit later, and this time there was no wheel included, and the instructions just recommended you improvise your own out of a roll of tape or something similar. You could play with the keyboard or the joystick, but where's the fun in that? Now I've got to say that this works oh, at least a thousand times better than I was expecting, and it's still not that great, but it is at least playable. With a little bit of practice, it is possible to get the car round the track and at least play the game. And once you have got the hang of it, there is something, well, almost satisfying about it. Actually, that's a little bit unfair. It is sort of oddly fun for a while. The brutal difficulty curve is the biggest problem, though. You get absolutely no second chances, come off the track, and it's game over. Yeah, I think the biggest problem is the fact that this is just not that good a game. There's way better racing games on the Specky. This was somehow Mastertronic's biggest selling game, with over half a million copies shipped. Why, why, why? Well, I don't really know, but the name alone, I would guess, would go a long way. Or maybe it was tapping into some undiscovered primal lust in the nation's youth to play a game with a roll of tape or something. Whatever, it's now a long-forgotten chapter in our nation's history, so let's move on to the close of this silliness. Though you never know, there might be some Silicon Valley startup out there ready to revitalise the idea of rolling tape on a computer keyboard. It might be the sort of synergistic paradigm-shaking idea that the world really needs. But enough of that, let's move on. So overall, I'm very happy with the way this turned out. I've got an eye-catching renewed spectrum that's now at working great. The case from ZX Renu really is fantastic if you can handle the price. You really don't need to have anything quite as loud and mismatched as mine. There's a fair amount of colour choices. The only wrinkle I had with mine was the missing sticky tape, but that was hardly a major issue. It's just a shame that it's only the original specy cases that are available. Other systems would be fantastic too. The video mod was a definite win too. It does look quite good when you see it, even on my, of course, very unforgiving modern flat panel. Your mileage may vary, but I would recommend this mod if these simpler solutions don't work, and I'll stick a link to various resources below. There is some visible sort of interference or glitching in the form of dot crawl, but that is to be expected with this model of the Specky, without some more complex add-ons anyway. One final thing, yes, the key mat is glow-in-the-dark. Stupid, yes, but I couldn't resist. How does it look? Well, the pictures aren't going to do it justice, but it does glow quite well. Pointless, pretty much, though it might make things a bit easier when you're spectruming in the dark. Is that a thing that people do? It probably is these days, isn't it? Okay then, time to wrap it up and say farewell and goodbye and thanks for watching. Thanks, as always, to my generous patrons whose names are listed here right before your very eyes. There's a link below if you'd like to join them, and I'll see you next time.